May I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientist. This is the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science and technology with me, Chris Smith, and with Adam Murphy. NASA have stated that they are heading back to the moon in 2024. This week, we're finding out why and what's in store for us as we head back. And in the news, cave paintings dated to 40,000 years ago, the strange magnetic fields that have been found around the sun and the 3D printed rabbit with its own DNA. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by ukfast.co.uk. Now first this week, imagine if your skin was so fragile that even the slightest knock caused it to blister and tear. This is the reality for people with a condition called epidermolysis bullosa. It occurs when a person inherits faulty copies of the genes that make the crucial skin protein collagen. But help may now be at hand. Because Columbia University researcher Joanna Jackoff has found a way to make stem cells, which are called IPS cells, from patients' skin cells. Edit the faulty genes in those stem cells and use the now repaired cells to grow new, healthy skin. It's the first step towards skin replacements for patients with these sorts of genetic diseases. Patients have um, extensive blister in the skin because they born with this mutation. The skin started to blister right after the birth. These blisters are chronic wounds that are not healed and these chronic wounds convert to um, extensive scarring and finally with um, increasing age the patients get a skin cancer called squamous cell carcinoma. And what's the approach you've taken to try to put this right? Using this magic uh, genetic scissors called CRISPR, we can fix this mutation in a cells called induced pluripotent stem cells, which are cells that we can generate from patients' own cells because the cells have a potential of differentiation to any cell type we want, in our case, skin cells, we can develop skin equivalents, which we called grafts. And this skin equivalent can be grafted on the wounded area of the skin. So you're saying make some stem cells, fix the gene problem in those stem cells, and then grow new rafts of skin from the fixed stem cells so that you've got new skin to put on to the individuals with the condition. That's correct. How do you go, though, from those fixed skin cells into actually making skin? Uh, yes, we take the right um, the right cells now and um, putting them together in a matrix called collagen. And the cells will grow into a normal skin that we call a skin equivalent. And they, um, the skin equivalent can be grafted on the patients. Have you tested this, though, in the sense that you've got these patches of skin equivalent? Do they survive in the long term? And, for instance, if you put them onto an animal in place of its own skin, do they work? Yes, we used for this immune deficient uh, mouse model, which is a model which doesn't um, have immune system and will not reject these grafts. And we've been testing uh, the survival of these grafts two months post grafting. And we could demonstrate that the grafts survived and produced this protein that was uh, missing in previously in the patient's skin. In other words, the implication is, were you to do this in a patient, because it would be their own cells, there wouldn't be an immune problem. So you could just put these skin patches on in place of the individual's injured skin, and it should take over the function of their injured skin and, and give them a healthy working skin. Exactly. That's exactly what is the concept of our strategy. Big problem, though, when you consider how big a person is. I mean, the surface area of a human, that's, you know, metres squared of skin, isn't it? So is it feasible to actually do this on the scale of the entire body? Because you'd have to replace all their skin, wouldn't you? Um, yes, this is an excellent question, and we've been already thinking of this. So we would like to first cover the large wounds of the patient body, and we hope that uh, because we are deriving the skin equivalents from keratinocyte, that hopefully have also a population of stem cell 
eventually these grafts can take over and cover the whole body of the patient. Thing is, skin isn't just skin producing cells, is it? There's hair follicles in there. There are more complicated structures like sweat glands as well. Those aren't going to be present in the grafts you make, are they? That's what we are thinking as a next step, to make more complex uh, skin, including all these uh, very important components, as you mentioned, hair follicle and sweat glands. This is uh, what we keep in mind in the future. Well, let's hope it works. Exciting though, isn't it? Joanna Jackoff there, and uh, that work was published in the journal PNES. Now, barcodes are everywhere, to the point where you probably don't notice them until you're stuck with a nasty bill or you hear this noise. But this week, one of the pioneers of barcode technology, George Laura, died at age 94. With us to reflect on how lines of black and white equate to a loaf of bread and George Laura's world-changing technologies, angel investor and tech commentator Peter Cowley. So, Peter, how does a barcode actually work? Yes, hello, Adam. We all know what a barcode looks like because we see that on retail products, and they're basically a set of vertical lines. They're black lines of varying widths, and actually, if you look closely at it, you'll see the white lines have also got varying widths. There's four different widths of black and white, and together they make up a code. That code is on a retail product, a variety of barcodes. It was become a linear, one-dimensional barcode here. A variety, they, they make up, there's 100 billion combinations here. So that's obviously <laughs> a great deal. Some of that will be the, the manufacturer or the distributor, but it will be the product code as well. So a device actually looks at this and converts it to a number, which is also printed on anyway in case the barcode is not readable. So a checkout operator potentially could type that in. So they're basically encoding a set of numeric digits or possibly alpha numeric characters into a set of vertical lines. And how did we end up with these set of lines? How did they get invented and how did they end up in shops? Yes, George Laura and, in fact, uh, a guy called Joe Woodland, who died a few years ago, in the early 50s produced something loosely based on Morse code. So if you think about it, on, off, on, off, if you know Morse code. And apparently he was walking along a beach at one point and he drew lines in the sand and from that he decided that's a great way of doing it. The initial barcodes actually were circular, but they found the printers in those days in the early 70s weren't good enough, so they turned into the linear ones. What happened was the National Association of Food Chains in the States decided they want to encode somehow, and so they put out a tender, and a number of people went in there, and in fact, in the end, it was IBM that won this, and these two people worked, George and and Joe worked for that. And the first retail barcode was scanned in in 74. Uh, It was a packet of chewing gum, apparently. Wow, now, you, you can't scan a barcode without a barcode scanner. How do those work? Actually, you can. I've been involved in barcodes for 35 years, and there is something, which I think is interleaved 2 or 5, which you can actually read. (laughs) That's super geeky. (laughs) But generally, having looked at the UPC in front of me here, which UPC Universal Product Code, I can't read that. The original reading was done, and I have I go back long enough that I remember buying these things, was a wand. And the end of the wand was a light source, and there was a receptor. And as you pulled it across, with your hand across it, it would read light, dark, light, dark. And the timing, which would give you the width of the whites and the width of the black, and that's then encoded, sent back to some sort of computer system and that's worked it out. Didn't you have to therefore make sure you drew it at a very standard rate then, Peter, if no, it was the timing? No, it worked it out. I mean, obviously, if you'd stop, start, stop, start, it wouldn't work. But generally, the hand, it's not very far, it's only an inch or so, you know, across, 32 millimetres. And so that was possible. That was, of course, a, uh, it damaged the substrate, it would damage the paper because you're actually pressing on it. So the CCD, charge couple device, arrived, which read the whole lot at once, either with ambient light or with its own LED. And the ones we see in the supermarkets now a laser laser diode and it's got a rotating mirror or prism which then scans it very rapidly and went just sorry to interrupt but you know i'm fascinated by that so is there basically the the laser beam is scanning backwards and forwards how is it reading is is it that the laser bounces off of the 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 white bits but not the black bits exactly exactly and then there's a face receptor exactly yeah and now, you mentioned there were circular barcodes, but what other kinds of barcodes can you have? Well, of the linear ones, these are the, the one-dimensional ones, there are about 30-odd, and they store usually 20 or maximum 30 characters, sometimes less than that. But, of course, many of us have now seen the 2D barcodes. There are about 40 different types of 2D barcodes. These are the ones that look like a, a dot matrix, a matrix of lots of dots, and these can store several thousand characters. They've got gr- much greater resilience, and I've got a barcode here which you won't see on the radio, with a picture of my face in it, (laughs) which is actually a link to my LinkedIn profile. My face takes up a lot of the middle of the thing and it still reads
reads perfectly because there's a lot of resilience and redundancy in a 2D barcode. I remember uh, when I was walking around Dublin someday on a literary festival, they had copies that would let you link to James Joyce's Ulysses that you could download, but I didn't because I was suspicious of how safe they Absolutely. were. Absolutely. They, they there are all kinds of ways of sending you to the wrong website, which could be malicious, could be a phishing website. There's a potential there of um, premium rate text being being sent from that there's also there's not really the possibility of executing illegal code that's okay but it, you can certainly i would never recommend scanning something that unless you know what it's it's like putting something in your mouth you don't know what it is <laughs> isn't it you wouldn't do that can i just very briefly mention rfid that's the next stage so this is where they, there's a chip these things are obviously more expensive because there's some technology there they actually put them in japanese banknotes so there is a chip in each one in the metal stripe so they have to be very cheap but generally that is probably the future of barcodes when the price can be got right. They work a bit differently though, don't they? I mean, the way they work is that there's a signal sent from a device which then effectively gives energy to the thing that's Correct. in the product, which then does a bit of processing and sends back a signal, it, it which is unique to that product. Back. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But that's hidden, and it, also you can write to that device as well. And obviously the power of that is unlike the barcode you've got in front of you, which someone's physically got to scan. These things, it basically, they'll respond whenever their wake-up call is transmitted H- anywhere near the problem with people uh, privacy and the fact that you supposedly can read them into your pocket from a distance across the road. Uh, and the problem I have, which is I always seem to set these things off when leaving shops, despite the fact uh, I have not di- stolen well, anything. Well, exactly. And I- let's talk about that later, <laughs> actually, Chris. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I do that. Even if I know I haven't taken anything, I still paranoidly panic <laughs> walking through those scanners. Well, well Peter Kelly, Th- thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you. Hiya, I'm Phil Sansom, and I host the Naked Genetics podcast. Genetics is huge right now. From those home DNA testing kits to futuristic gene therapies to treat diseases. And if, like me, you're just trying to get a grip on what genes can and can't tell you, then this might be the show for you. Each month, we are telling scientific detective stories and shining a light in directions you might not expect. Like gene sequencing a puppy. Chris? Biscuit? Or maybe tearing apart a flower. Oh boy, you've taken all the parts off. Well, that one I messed up, so that shows you how how good he had to get at this. And even drinking a bunch of gin. It's very refreshing. Don't miss out. Subscribe to Naked Genetics wherever you get your podcasts. Next, though, scientists have created a DNA sequence containing the computer code for 3D printing a plastic rabbit. But in an even more cunning twist, they've developed a way to enclose the DNA inside microscopic glass beads that can themselves be mixed into the plastic used to print the rabbit. Now what this means is, just as biology endows every one of our body cells with the molecular recipe for a human, every part of one of these plastic rabbits contains the DNA code to make another plastic rabbit. And by chipping off part of its ear, getting the DNA out, decoding the instructions... And then using those instructions, is it was possible for the team to 3D print a further five generations of these rabbits. Amalia Thomas heard from the study's author, Robert Grass, how they did it. So what we've done is that we've shown that we can store digital information in everyday objects, and we use DNA as a data storage medium to do that. What do you mean by DNA? Do you actually mean what's inside our bodies? Exactly. So we use exactly the same molecule as biology uses to store our own blueprints. But we don't use natural DNA, but we have the DNA chemically synthesized in the sequence we we design it for. How much information can be stored in DNA? So theoretically, you can store tremendous amounts of information in DNA. Probably all the information we have in the world would fit into a few grams of DNA. What we do, we put the DNA into objects and you could put really, really large amounts of digital information into everyday items. So how did you do this? What technique did you apply to store information as DNA in an everyday object? To do this, we have to first translate the information to DNA. For that, we have an encoder that was developed by my collaborator, Janif Ehrlich. He's an expert in doing this translation of digital information to let's say, DNA sequences. We then have this DNA synthesized by a company that makes DNA. But you can't just mix it with polymers because DNA doesn't mix with polymers. The DNA would not be phase stable. To get around those problems, the DNA, we encapsulated it as small glass capsules 
which are just 100 nanometers in size. When we put the DNA in these glass capsules, it's protected from decay and we can mix it easier with polymer solutions. So once we have the DNA in these particles, we mix the particles with the polymer solution, solidify the polymer, and then the, the polymer contains the particles containing the DNA, containing the digital file. Could you give us an example? The examples we really did is uh, 3D printed objects, which contain their own building instruction or blueprint within the 3D printed item. So one of the most common 3D printed parts people make is called a Stanford bunny. So we have this 3D information of the bunny as a digital file, which we use to print the bunny. But at the same time, we take that digital file, we translate it to DNA and infuse that DNA into the polymer from which we print the bunny so that the bunny then contains its building instructions as DNA in the final item. And so what you can do, you can take a piece of the bunny, read the 3D file from which it was made from the DNA and use that to make more clones of that original bunny. So far, we've done five generations, but we could go to significantly more bunny generations and they would still be perfect clones of the original bunny we had made. Isn't that amazing? You could say they're breeding or even being replicated like rabbits. That was Robert Grass. He is at ETH Zurich. He's based in Switzerland. And the work he was discussing was published in the journal Nature Biotechnology. Now, from rabbits here on Earth to magnetism out in space, Adam is here to shed some light on some of the latest news from the very centre of our solar system. In August of 2018, NASA launched the Parker Solar Probe and sent it hurtling off towards the sun to further our understanding of the source of our sunlight. The probe is about the size of a car with a heat shield covering one side so that it can withstand the enormously high temperatures. The other side has a suite of instruments on it, like magnetic field detectors to help us probe into the sun. The probe is currently orbiting the sun, getting closer and closer to its atmosphere, which is known as the corona. Now, as it approaches, it's discovered something unusual in the sun's magnetic field, which may help to explain some of the deepest mysteries about the sun, like how the atmosphere around it is hundreds of times hotter than the surface. I heard how from Christopher Chen at Queen Mary University in London, who was involved with interpreting the data from one of the solar probe's instruments. We found several new uh, and unexpected discoveries. So one of these is the fact that we found these big folds in the magnetic field near the sun. So the spacecraft has a magnetic field sensor and what it found was that within the period of a few seconds the magnetic field flips direction entirely. So at one moment it's pointing away from the sun and then in a few seconds later it flips to be pointing towards the sun and then it flips again and is pointing away from the sun again. And this is sort of unexpected, it's not been seen further out and we don't know exactly what is causing these large flips in the, in the magnetic field. And that kind of thing doesn't happen here on Earth, does it? In the solar wind at, at Earth, there are large amplitude fluctuations in the magnetic field, but these flips are certainly not as clear and, and pronounced as we're seeing up close to the sun. It, it looks like a different type of structure that's occurring, yeah. And as it's getting closer, is it changing those flips or is how static are they? So they are getting more intermittent and more bursty. What is seen is that as we're going closer to the sun, there are there are these periods where the solar wind is very, very quiet and the magnetic field is not flipping at all. But then there are these periods where it's, it's flipping all over the place um, really uh, rapidly and at all kinds of timescales as well. So some of these, so we call them switchbacks. So some of these switchbacks last for just a couple of seconds. Some of them last for, for minutes. So it's, it's really much more bursty and much more sort of complex and, and dynamic up close to the sun. Given how big the sun is, given the scale of it, the idea that the magnetic field can flip over the course of seconds seems really, really intense to me. Yeah, so the it's so when I say the magnetic field's flipping, it's not the entire magnetic field of the sun, but it's it's the magnetic field in the solar wind where the spacecraft is measuring. So the if you think of the magnetic field around the sun, it's not a simple shape that you'd get from a bar magnet, but it's actually a really complex, intricate structure. So there's loops of magnetic field on the sun. There are these long striations of magnetic field lines that, that stretch far out into the solar wind. So it's really the flips within this structure of the magnetic field as it, as it points away from the sun. And what 
other kind of things is the solar probe measuring? So, for example, there's an instrument which measures the solar wind velocity as it travels away from the sun. And what that found was that as we're going in closer, the solar wind is not flowing just radially away from the sun in a straight line. The solar wind is spinning around in a circle as it's traveling away from the sun. But the speed of this spin is much faster than we expected from our models. So we say that things that are spinning have angular momentum, and the solar wind is something which can transport angular momentum away from the sun. So what that's really causing is the sun to, to be spinning at a, at a slower rate than it otherwise would be. So the solar wind is, is carrying away the spin from the sun. And what implications do these results have for our understanding of the sun? So they're really sort of changing our view of what's happening. One of the big mysteries of the sun and solar physics is something known as the coronal heating problem. So the corona is um, at a temperature of, of more than a million degrees, whereas the surface of the sun is, is at a few thousand degrees. So it's really the, the atmosphere of the sun is hundreds of times hotter than its surface. And this has been a long-standing mystery in solar physics. So one of the things we're finding is that the, the amplitude of the fluctuations are, are getting much larger as we're going in closer. So as I said, we have these big folds in the magnetic field, and they contain a lot of energy in them. So we're thinking that these are involved somehow in the process which is causing the corona to be heated to such high temperatures. And uh, another thing is, is the existence of the solar wind itself. The solar wind, by the time it gets to the Earth, is, is traveling at around uh, a million miles per hour or so. And it's, again, another open question as to, to how the solar wind comes to be traveling so fast. We think, again, that these large amplitude fluctuations and this sort of complex, chaotic, dynamic environment is providing the energy to, to push the solar wind and cause it to be accelerated to these large speeds. Lastly, what's next for the solar probe? What's, what's it going to start measuring now? So over the next few years, it's going to be getting uh, gradually closer and closer to the sun. And one thing that we expect to happen within perhaps the next year or two is it to, to cross within the solar corona itself. So it has not got within the corona yet, but we're expecting it to do so within the next few years. And then it's really going to be in a, in a completely new unexplored area of space right, right up close to the sun. Brilliant. Boggles your mind at the same time, doesn't it? Thanks very much to Christopher Chen there for shedding a bit of light on what the Parker Solar Probe has been discovering. He is based at Queen Mary University of London and those findings have just been published across three papers in the journal Nature. Back down to Earth now and deep inside a cave on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia may lie the oldest ever cave art depiction of our ancestors hunting. Painted more than 40,000 years ago, it gives us a rare glimpse into how early humans may have thought and acted. Nadim Gabani asked cave art specialist Alice Sampson, who wasn't herself involved in the work to date the painting, for her reaction to the discovery. This cave is quite hard to access. It's quite out of the way. The rock art is in a cave, the opening of which it leads out from the back of another cave. It's like seven metres up in the cave wall. You have to scramble up there and the rock art itself is like three metres above floor level. The art is actually really interesting and really quite beautiful. And what we see is quite a dynamic scene of kind of multiple animals that seemingly are sort of like galloping across the wall. And then a whole bunch of smaller figures, which the authors in the paper called therianthropes, which is basically a long word, which means kind of like figures with combinations of human and animal features. So there's these kind of human animally mini figures chasing or scampering around after a lot of larger beasts. These are kind of drawn in what looks like a kind of red ochre sort of pigment or paint on the limestone walls of, of a cave. Incredible. So they're also saying that this is the oldest hunting scene that has ever been found. What do you think they're hunting? What's the significance? To be honest, we don't know what the original art actually means, OK? But the significance of it in terms of understanding human evolution and human cognition and thought processes, that's where its significance lies, I think, because it's showing that as far back as like 40,000 years ago, people were depicting kind of abstract thoughts and ideas in kind of artistic form on, for example, cave walls or in small carvings. It's pretty exciting, this paper that these archaeologists have done have obtained some like really early dates for for this rock art which kind of predates by several thousand years stuff that's found in the area and also early paleolithic rock art in in europe although the dates themselves is not actually a direct dating of the rock art what they've done is used a technique called 
uranium thorium dating, which dates flowstone, the way that kind of stalactites and stalactites form on top of the rock art. And so they've got a date for that material that's formed on top of the rock art. And that basically gives you a date before which the rock art must have been made. So that the, the flowstone is dated to around sort of 40,000 years ago, and the art underneath is then earlier than that. How does this kind of link to the migration of man from Africa, for example? There were Homo sapiens in Southeast Asia much earlier than this than this rock art, but this rock art represents some of the earliest sort of evidence for symbolic thought and abstract thinking by anatomically modern humans. Briefly back to the rock art itself, these hunters, they have animal heads. Any comments about that? This is a really common feature of early rock arts, okay? It often depicts humans and animals and human animally things. We're obsessed in our kind of modern scientific approach to the world in uh, taxonomies and, you know, the difference between particular you know, different species and humans being separate and different entities from, from animals and plants and things like that. But this is a, this is a particularly kind of um, enlightenment and kind of modern sort of rational scientific way of conceiving the world and we cannot make the same assumptions that about the past and about the ways that in which people in the past saw their world so yes it does look like a hunting scene the authors have sort of pointed to the presence of maybe ropes or spears and the fact that these little figures the little animal human figures are chasing maybe or corralling or certainly interacting with these animals so it certainly looks like it could be a hunting scene but whether it's just a sort of straightforward depiction of an everyday activity or whether it is something more sort of complex than that I think is hard to say I would say that it's actually speaking about kind of much bigger topics about the relationships between humans and animals and their environments you know this is not a casual activity I imagine the actual sort of painting of the rock art itself was a very sort of significant and ritual practice rather than just a kind of casual doodle. That was Alice Sampson from the University of Leicester commenting on the study published in Nature. We're time now to delve into the mailbox, the part of the programme where we look at the feedback, comments, thoughts, criticisms that you've been sending in, which you can do so to chris at thenakedscientist.com or tweet at Naked Scientist. Now, John Hayes has been in touch on Twitter, and given that most of the office has come down with some kind of cold or another this week, his question is pretty fitting. He wants to know exactly what mucus is. Chris, you're the virology expert. What exactly is going on there? Well, John, and the rest of the human race who are being assailed by these winter bugs, the answer is that mucus is a protein and water-rich material made by special mucus-producing cells that line your airways. These are chiefly called goblet cells, and they secrete onto the airway surface this layer of sticky material, which we're all too familiar with. Its role in health is actually to trap debris, dust, microbes, anything, and, and stick it down. And then tiny hairs in your airways, which are called stereocilia, which all beat in a rhythm, create currents in this mucus, washing it out of your lungs and deeper airways up to your throat, where you can then swallow it, and then stomach acid kills whatever, or denatures whatever is lodged inside it. So mucus is basically a mixture of proteins and water, which is sticky, and it's there to grab things that shouldn't be in your airways and help you remove them. And when you get a bad cold or a bad infection... This mucus secretion process goes into overdrive as a defence mechanism and also because when you get inflammation caused by the infection in your airways, it increases the blood flow and if you increase the blood flow, you make more more water and more mucus. So that's why the levels increase dramatically when you have an infection. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, John, for sending in that question. And if you want to get in touch, you can email chris at thenakedscientist.com or find us on Facebook or tweet at Naked Scientists. And if you'd like to find out more details about any of the stories we've been covering in the programme, as well as transcripts and download the audio for the individual parts of the programme, you can do all of that from our website. You go to nakedscientist.com. It's all there. Music in the programme is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for your audio and video productions. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire. Cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. This is The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith, and with Adam Murphy. And this week, the moon is firmly in our sights. NASA have announced they're going back there in 2024. And in fact... 
On this day that we're recording this programme, 47 years ago in 1972, the Apollo 17 astronauts had just left the lunar surface and they were homeward bound. That was the last time we were actually there on the moon. So what is waiting for us up there and what's it going to take to get us back there? This week we're finding out. First up, what exactly is the moon and why might we want to go back there in the first place? The moon has fascinated us since time immemorial. Formed as leftover debris from a primordial collision, our biggest natural satellite holds a special place in all our hearts. But we haven't been back since Apollo 17 in 1972. However, new missions are sending humanity back to the moon. But what's there for us? I spoke with Lewis Dartnell from the University of Westminster about what is actually up there for humanity. Well, what we've learnt from the Apollo missions in, in the late 1960s and early 70s, when we're able to go to specific locations on the moon's surface and bring back rocks, bring back geological samples back to the Earth that we can study, is the astonishing thing is that the rocks on the moon are very, very similar to the rocks on Earth, at least their composition of different elements and isotopes is very, very similar to, to the Earth. So that's why we think that's one of the best pieces of evidence we have that the Earth and Moon have both come from the same basic mixing pot, as it were. Although the exact kind of rocks and minerals we find on the Moon are exceedingly bone dry, far drier than any of the rocks we find on Earth, uh, because Earth is covered with this lovely thick atmosphere, and deep oceans, the moon is exceedingly dry in comparison. So if moon rocks are like earth rocks, and we've got plenty of earth rocks down here, what's up there we might want? The sort of things that we talk about in terms of in situ resource utilisation, which is just you know, kind of space talk that that's kind of nerd talk for living off the land if we're trying to send humans to survive on the moon in lunar colonies or lunar habitats we're going to have to find things on the moon that we need to help us survive there so things like water ice near the poles would be very useful on the moon for not just drinking water for astronauts in a moon base but also splitting that water splitting that h2o to give off oxygen which we can use uh, for breathing but we also think there are things which have an inherent value on the moon that we could export from the moon back to the earth. And these sort of resources would be metals which are either rare or hard to mine effectively on the earth. Things like platinum or tungsten. Or they might be other resources which we haven't started using on the earth. And one of these sort of resources would be something like helium-3. And we think that helium-3, one of the isotopes of helium, would be the ideal fuel for nuclear fusion reactors. But what is it that's bringing us up there again? And why now? Another very good reason to go back to the moon would be effectively as a stepping stone on our journey, on, on humanity's path out to the planets. And the next logical step would be to start sending humans to Mars and perhaps trying to establish some kind of human presence there. But Mars is just so much further away than the moon is. And if, and if you are an astronaut in a human colony on Mars and you have some kind of emergency, maybe some of your uh, technology on the base keeping you alive starts malfunctioning, maybe you have some kind of medical emergency, you would have to wait perhaps several months before the Earth and Mars start lining up in their orbits so you could launch to come back home. And what we would therefore want to do before we start attempting a long-term human habitation on Mars is to learn all of our lessons and make sure we can get things right on what is effectively our own front doorstep on the moon. So the moon in that sense represents a much closer, safer place, a, a test bed, if you like, for all the technologies and tools we'd need for exploring Mars and then out through the rest of the solar system. And does Lewis see a future in which humans are living on the moon long term? I do. Um, it's, it's something that 
you know, within my own, own research of astrobiology and space exploration, it's something I think would be very, very exciting and something very important for humanity to do. So, you know, you start spreading beyond our own planet, look beyond into new horizons, start establishing a permanent human presence on the moon, possibly Mars, possibly out through the asteroid belt, maybe mine these places for useful stuff to support human civilization back on our homeworld. Lewis Startnell from Westminster University there. Makes you think, doesn't it? Well, with us now is Mahesh Anand. He's Professor of Planetary Science and Exploration at the Open University. Mahesh is actively involved in a joint mission between Europe and Russia to drill and analyse samples on the moon in search of water and other chemicals. So what actually is this mission then and what's its timeline? The the European Space Agency is uh, collaborating with the Roscosmos and by 2024 uh, we plan to land at the Lunar South Pole region uh, to test first of all whether there is really water ice near there. If it is there then how much of it is there, what is its distribution like and how much of it can be actually extracted in the form of water. Is your mission a rover mission? Will you land something a bit like we've got Curiosity trundling around on the surface of Mars or is this a static thing, you will land something in one place and then do all your tests there? No, this is just a lander mission so this will simply land at a location and there it has a limited functionality in the sense that it will have about uh, a metre or so, or two metres or so, within its reach. Um, so, so it's, it's an arm, is it? It, that it you will can have extend? an arm uh, that can extend, and also it will have a drill that will have certain mobility to actually uh, vary itself um, and, and then subsample the, the, the surface. So it'll go into the surface, get yeah. some samples at varying depths, it knows how far it's gone. How does it then get the chemical composition of the surface? How does it know what it's tasting? Right, so, so it's a combination of two different things so drill is one piece that the Europe is providing and the other bit is a chemical laboratory that's called PROSPA. Now this laboratory is being currently built at the Open University and the idea is that the drill actually is going to drill at different depths almost up to a meter depth and then from time to time it is going to actually bring the drill material to this laboratory which is then going to cook it up and then whatever gets released gets detected by the mass spectrometer which would be in this instrument. So chiefly water because the other thing we heard about from Lewis Dartnell just now was other things like rare earths like precious metals as well because of the asteroid and and other impactors that have hit the moon in the past and we think that that there may be some surface material there from that source can you analyze all of those things so in principle yes all of those things could be analyzed but I think we have to first decide on our priority list and as scientists who are actually working on this mission we all decided that actually finding water is probably probably going to be the biggest thing, first of all, followed by other things that could be measured. And remember, this is going to be just at a location. And if water could be found, then I think it, there will be you know, more reason to go back to the moon, to other areas, and actually do further analysis. And, and this is not something that the rocks that Apollo 12 and, and so on brought back with them. We can't get enough information from those samples. You want to go to that location. Is this not a bit like throwing a dart into a dartboard and just ending up in one place and you just have to hope you're lucky and you hit the triple 20 with or the bullseye with where you land this thing or is or is it more informed your landing site decision it, it is actually quite a detailed exercise so it's not as simple as just you know blindly landing somewhere there's a lot of work that is going on where actually colleagues are looking at remote sensing data set at a very high resolution and trying to figure out what could be the best landing spot that actually ticks all those boxes Um, more importantly can you land safely because safety is paramount you have to land safely and then secondly can you actually land safely in an area where actually there is an enhanced signature for the presence of water ice within the first meter of the surface because remember you can only drill up to a meter or depth or so. So these are all different mm, combinations that are t- you know, taking place at the moment. When you're making a drill that goes onto the moon, what's different from a drill you would have on Earth? Is there anything different about it? 
In short, no, it's not a huge amount of difference. But what you have to understand is that on Earth, you can change your drill, you can change your drill bit if it gets you stuck. And <laughs> and you know sort of what sort of strength you are actually drilling through in a rock. On the moon, if you do have water ice, then some tests that has been done in the laboratories have shown that even the presence of few percent of water ice could make the whole thing harder than a piece of concrete. So drilling mm. in a water-saturated lunar regolith is not not going to be as straightforward as we might think. Is there a precedent for what you're doing in the sense that are you just basically aiming to do safely and better what we've already done using existing technology or have you had to break new ground, not just lunar surface, in order to physically get this thing onto the moon's surface by the time you make it happen? So so I think there are two bits to this question. The first one is that to, to devise the drill that actually is going to be uh, flown onto this uh, is, is sort of a replica of a drill that is being built for the Exo Mars mission that is going to launch next year. So there's a lot of uh, research that has gone in into devising the drill. And secondly, the material on Mars and Moon are going to be very, very different. So the expected strength of the material that you are going to drill through are also going to be different. So there's a lot of tests going on on things that we call simulants, which are what the what the name says, you know, they are trying to simulate the the geotechnical properties of the material that we are expected to encounter on these surfaces. How are you going to power that drill? Because a metre into a very hard material, that's going to take a lot of work. So what's the power source? So um, in this case, it uh, is all going to be uh, done by uh, solar. Uh, solar panels and and that's why it's also time limited that uh, you know you, you charge them up during the day and 14 then... days yeah that's right so we, we don't know whether the the mission will survive beyond one uh, lunar night what if we don't find any water up there what's the plan if that happens so it's, it's a very good question, actually. And, and we have been actually thinking about this possibility because, you know, it's a landed mission. And if you don't find where you land water, what do you do then? So the Prosper Laboratory that I mentioned also uh, will carry a small experiment, which is um, to demonstrate that if you don't find any water, you could still extract oxygen which is present almost everywhere because half of the moon is oxygen and it will be carrying its own hydrogen canister and it is going to actually extract the oxygen from the lunar rocks and react it with the hydrogen that it is carrying to produce water. Now, that if we can demonstrate that that can be done, then that paves way for a future in situ resource utilisation on the moon itself. This is exciting, isn't it? Yes. Are you excited? Uh, completely, because the problem yes. with space research, these missions last so long, you've got to stake basically your whole career on this and hope it works, haven't you, potentially? Uh, I think that's why it is so exciting and it is why so exciting for those, potentially those who are actually trying to make up their mind what to do in future. So if you are one of those young ones who are going through GCSE and actually trying to decide what to do in future, this is for you. Because what we are talking here is what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years and you are going to be the next leaders. Mahesh is hiring now, everyone who's doing your GCSE, so uh, get your application. <laughs> I'm only joking. Mahesh Anand from the Open University, thanks very much indeed for coming to tell us all about it. So we know what might be on the moon and the potential that awaits us if we can get there, but is that enough to justify this full set of missions? And does it have to be humans that go back to the moon? Why not send robots? So to find out more about the state of technology at the moment and what's going to take to blast us onto the moon, Nadim spoke to Torsten Kreening of Spacewatch Global and Philippe Schoenens of the European Space Agency. What is in for us? I mean, that's a big question when you talk with people which are not like me, space geeks. What's in for me? But why should we spend these euros, these dollars, on space program, what comes back? First of all, it's the innovation, it's the inspiration, it's the imagination when we do so really the next big thing. It's not just nations slash agencies that are behind it and finance these endeavors. There are also private companies such as Blue Origin are run by, by the Amazon boss Jeff Bezos or SpaceX are with their lunar ambitions and that's Elon Musk Many of the companies that came out of the Google Lunar X Prize, the commercial offerings ranging around a million US dollar per kilogram payload to the surface of the moon. So that gets us to the moon, but what's going to keep us there? 
Philippe Schönhans, Robotics and Future Projects Team Leader in the Human and Robotic Exploration Division at ESA, gives us an insight. There, there's a whole scala of, of things that we need for to be on the moon. And definitely shelter against radiation It's one thing. If we go for very, very short, we have computed that it's, it's sort of allowable. Uh, but if, if we want to stay for any, any length of stay, we have to look at the radiation. So we've also been looking at having like a cylindrical element like that exactly what fits in a, in a rocket. Uh, to put it and to cover it completely with moon dust as, a, as protection against radiation. So definitely this is one area that we need, the shelter we need. We need water. Of course, the Chandrayaan have already sh- demonstrated that there definitely is water on the south pole of the moon. So that's something that we have to we have to recover from the from the ice. But also that is something that we need for a bit longer stay. For one or two days, you would never do that. You would just take the water. We need power. There's 14 days of day and then 40 days of night on the moon. So we always are struggling with what to do with the 14 days of night. It can get like freezing cold and uh, minus a couple of hundred degrees. Then what do you do there and um, with uh, no sunshine? So definitely we have to look at, uh, at power. I think during the day it's okay, the solar rays would work. But uh, during the night we need something else. We need a less clumsy EVA suit. And if we look at in the old movies from... Um, from the past, from the Apollo missions, you see how incredibly clumsy they were. They were friends. You could not pick up anything from the sur- uh, from the surface. You need some tool to do that. If they fell over, they had immense trouble getting back up again. And NASA has now presented the new suits, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, which are way more flexible, And uh, that, but they are, they are not yet at the end of their development. And why are we even sending humans to the moon anyway? Can't we just send some robots? My clear, very clear view that we should not speak of humans or robots. We should always speak of humans and robots. But they have qualities that are uh, definitely synergetic. And it's clear that humans are they're more flexible. A lot of things that they still do better, like image recognition or replanning. If, if your conditions change or something unexpected uh, happens, uh, they, they can take more rocks uh, with them than, uh, than you could do with, uh, with a robot. On the other hand, the robots, they are better for... Anything which is either boring or dangerous or, or repetitive, it's obviously still cheaper to put uh, robots on the moon. So we look at teleoperation also to see whether we could put a robot on a small rover on the moon surface and teleoperate it from this lunar station. We've been doing a lot of experiments lately to develop the technology for it. So I think we, have, we need absolutely both. But also, if you look at our inspiration objective, then it is definitely still the case that one human on the moon is way more inspirational than 10 robots. So it seems as if not an awful lot has changed. We have rockets, we have space stations, and we have had landers. Where do we struggle? We need proper, sustainable rocket technology, really a a leap in in the development for guidance and navigation that is from the technology side, the big issues. Uh, but I'm talking here about precise landing. I'm talking about avoiding craters or uh, areas of eternal darkness. So th- that is something. I mean, on the on the software development. I mean, what what led to the two mistakes earlier this year when Israel as well as our India showed a hard landing on the moon? Sounds much better than to crash it. But uh, at the end, it was it was a crash. So what happened? Where human mistakes are in technical issues. But despite difficulties and expensive failures, the race continues. So what's the next small step for mankind? We do have multiple approaches to return to the moon. We have the NASA approach, the Artemis program, to put boots on the ground by 2024. At that stage, potentially a one-off mission, and then building an infrastructure later on. It is this ambitious goal within the next five years to get humans down on the moon again. On the other side, we have ESA, as you mentioned, with their programs. And I'm very happy that ESA just agreed to the highest budget ever, uh, namely 14.4 billion euro within the next five years. It's all happening so quickly, isn't it? The pace is frantic and incredible. Torsten Kroening there and before him, Philip Schoenjens. So why is it that the European Space Agency has received this bumper budget and what are they going to spend it on? Sue Horn is the head of space exploration for the UK Space Agency. So Sue, what is the future of manned missions to the moon? Well, for government funding, what we're looking at is putting in place the technologies we need to go on to Mars. It's not about a sustained lunar base. That will be looked at by 
uh, commercial entities who are thinking about using the lunar resources. So we need to develop technologies to sustain astronauts for the long journey to Mars and back to be able to use the resources at hand to sustain those astronauts and to be able to protect our astronauts from the radiation, the solar wind. Now, we heard other people mention across the show this idea of the lunar gateway. What is that? What does it look like? This is a small space station that will orbit the moon and it makes going to the moon more sustainable so that what you will have by... 2025, 2026, is actually a shuttle going from the gateway to the lunar surface and back. And that makes it a lot cheaper than sending a mission to the moon and back. So you shuttle your astronauts to the space station and then to the lunar surface. And how do you put a space station around the moon? Well, you you send it up in bits. So the first flight will be in 2021, which will send the propulsion and the power system. And then in 2022, the first habitation module will, will go there and it's fitted together like we built the International Space Station above the Earth. But it's going to be a lot smaller than the International Space Station. And now you're with the UK Space Agency. So what's the UK's involvement in these in these missions? Well, we are a member of the European Space Agency. We contributed £180 million to the exploration programme. And for that, the money actually flows back to UK industry. So we're expecting to participate in elements of the gateway. So we're very interested in doing the telecommunications and the refuelling element. We're also trying to develop commercial services at the moon. So we would like a UK company to provide a data relay service from the moon. And hopefully that will be launched in 2022. And that makes the science instruments and the elements you're going to put on the moon cheaper because you don't have to take such heavy communication systems. All you have to do is get your communication to the satellite orbiting the moon. Now, we've heard across the show that all of this is happening so quickly. What do you reckon the timeline is for getting to the moon and then getting further onto Mars? Well, I think NASA has got an ambitious, challenging uh, timescale of getting a man to the moon by 2024. They can do that. It, it is it is a, quite a tight schedule. It might slip a little bit but they are intent on getting there for 2024. I think going to Mars, that's a much longer thought. We still don't know quite how to keep our astronauts safe in that 500-day journey to Mars and back. So I would think, personally, I think it's about 2050. Some people are saying 2030, but I think that's far too soon. We won't have fully tested out the technologies on the moon by then. If I may come in there, Sue, what's the anticipated lifetime for for this gateway orbiter that will be around the moon? That's an interesting question. Space missions always last longer than originally anticipated. I used to work on a mission called Cluster, which was supposed to finish after two years, and that was launched early 2000s and is still going. The International Space Station was supposed to finish a couple of years ago and is still going strong and I expect it to be going till 2030. So the gateway, I believe the initial plans are at least till 2030, but it could be a lot longer than that. We we build very sound systems uh, because of the harsh environment, so it could could be going for some time. Sue Horn, thanks very much. And thank you also to our other contributors this week, Torsten Kreening, Philippe Schreinens and Mahesh Anand. And I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about this bright and very near future we've got for the moon. I'm just gobsmacked by the timeline and how soon all this is going to happen. It just takes your breath away. What an amazing thing. Well, on that note, we have to wrap up with our question of the week. And that is very much here, down on Earth. Amalia Thomas has been turning up the heat on this question for Tim. The experts at the Energy Saving Trust and British Gas say it's cheaper to heat your home only when you need it. 
but my heating control panel says that it uses less energy to keep a background temperature when the room is unoccupied than it does to allow the dwelling to chill too much, which advice is correct. Over on the forum, user Alan Calvert said, Heat loss depends on the source temperature, so if you let the room cool down in your absence, you won't be using or losing any heat. Frost protection is still essential, but the trick is to set the lowest protection temperature, obviously above zero degrees, that you can tolerate on your return. However, some refrigerators and freezers won't work in ambient below 15 degrees, so beware. We put Tim's question to Mike Childs, Head of Science, Policy and Research at Friends of the Earth. The answer is to only heat your home when you need it. You can think of your home like a slow puncture on a push bike that you can't be bothered to fix. Like a slow puncture that releases air, our homes slowly leak heat. You wouldn't pump air into the tire of your bike every 10 minutes if you only needed to use the bike in eight hours time. That would be a waste of energy. You just pump it up when you're ready to cycle home. In the same way, you only want to heat your home when you need it. Of course, the best option is to fix your puncture. And the best option for your home is to stop it leaking energy through fitting insulation. That's better for the planet and your pocket. And if you want to make your place warm by the time you get home from work, you might consider a timer or smart controls that allow you to adjust your heating remotely. But as Mike points out, what type of heating you have could be a factor here. If you've shifted away from using a gas boiler for your home to an electric powered air source heat pump, you do need to stop your house from getting too cold because it takes longer to heat up with an air source heat pump. The upside of an air source heat pump is that it will significantly cut the climate change causing carbon emissions that our gas heaters pump out every day. Heat pumps work by absorbing heat from a source, transferring it to a liquid which is compressed and transferred to water used to heat your home. As Mike mentioned, air can be the heat source, as can the ground. So the answer is fit insulation, only heat your home when you're in it, and think about switching to eco-friendly heating. Thank you, Mike, for helping us out there. Next time, we'll be answering this question from Derek. I can sit at my work desk with my phone by my side and the signal strength display goes from saying no service to four bars out of five within a couple of minutes, for no obvious reason. It varies like this all day, every day. I can understand why some places have good coverage and others bad coverage, but why should it vary so much in one place? So, what do you think about that? I know, for example, in my house, I meter by meter, I have different phone signal. So what do you think? Get in touch. You can go on to thenakedscientist.com slash question, email chris at thenakedscientist.com, find us on Facebook, tweet at Naked Scientist, or join in the debate on the forum, thenakedscientist.com slash forum. Got one spot in my house where I can get reception. I have to smear my face up my front window, walk away from there, no signal. Before we go, please don't forget that... We are running our donation drive. We've got a target. We're trying to reach it. We'd love to get there or as close to it as possible by Christmas. So if you can help the Naked Scientist, please do give generously. As an added inducement, we've teamed up with underluckystars.com. They produce fabulous star maps where you give them the date and they will produce for you a gorgeous star map of what the configuration of the night sky would have been on that particular date. We are going to give to three lucky people one of their fabulous star maps, they will frame it for you. Makes a wonderful gift. To be in with a chance to get one of these, and we're going to give the first three people out of the hat one, you've got to be a donor to the Naked Scientists in either November or December. And we'll include the people who are monthly donors. And if you can support us every month with a small contribution, it really helps. Every little really does help. So please go to nakedscientist.com forward slash donate and help us keep the show on the road. That is it. Thanks very much to Nadim Gabani who put the programme together. And do be sure to tune in next time when we have a very special programme brought to you by the Naked Gaming Crew. Yes, Chris and Lee are going to be here. So boot up your games console, grab your joystick and join us for Naked Gaming next week. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University. It's supported by the EPSRC and Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>